Our scripture for today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 through 15, uh, the beginning of which we heard a few weeks ago as Don preached about Jesus' baptism. And so we'll pick up there and continue on to the rest of the section. Let us listen for God's word. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Lord God, may your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, Hallmark really missed an opportunity this year. You know, sometimes I think that it must be such a struggle to come up with new messages year after year for the same holidays and occasions that those who actually write the words that you see in cards would welcome new opportunities for creativity or, or new angles, new, new avenues for their message. But nevertheless, I was honestly really disappointed last week as I was walking up and down the card aisle because I didn't find a single card that combined Valentine's Day and Ash Wednesday. I mean, what an opportunity that would have been for the frustrated card writer, tired of the same old statements and cliches and phrases, to, to now have to be able to broaden the scope of the card, to say and express both the sentiments of romantic love, but also the sobering truth of Ash Wednesday. You know, maybe something like, Roses are red, and violets are blue. From dust you were created, and you'll return to dust too. Or maybe this, this one might be a little more risky. Maybe uh, something like this. I love your smile. I love your laugh. But most of all, what I want to say on this Ash Wednesday slash Valentine's Day is I respect your mortality. You might need to get a nice gift accompanying that card, I guess. Uh, <laughs> You know, and this hadn't happened since 1945. That was the last time these two days happened on the same day, and so they're not going to get this opportunity, presumably, for quite some time. But I get such a kick out of the way the Christian liturgical calendar intersects with the secular cultural calendar. At times, the culture happily draws upon the Christian year. Think about Christmas music in the mall or... You're, you're the, aisles, the seasonal aisle of your local grocery store being overrun with red and green. But the broader culture wants little to do with the season of Lent. And that's because it's hard to commercialize repentance and fasting and prayer. No one is rushing out to buy sackcloth and ashes, or no one is rushing out to buy their kids the, the Lenten counterpart to Elf on a Shelf say, I don't know, monk in a trunk, who, uh, who makes sure that children are observing a holy Lent, and if they're not, they'll report it to the Easter Bunny or something. I don't know. I'm not sure how that whole thing works. No, the, the culture will rejoin us when we get to Easter. We're on our own for the next six weeks. When Lent arrives, it can be kind of a jolt to the system, it's sort of like the experience of reading this passage from Mark, where in the span of seven verses, we are pulled out of the waters of Jesus' baptism. We are rushed into the wilderness and then whisked away to Galilee for the start of Jesus' ministry. The wilderness, which is also translated as desert throughout Scripture, is obviously a significant 
uh, theme in the history of God's people, as is the number 40. In Scripture, the wilderness represents the place of God's deliverance. It also represents the place of trial and testing. It's the place where evil dwells. It is a thoroughly inhospitable environment. Regarding the number 40, the flood lasted 40 days and nights. Israel wandered in the desert for 40 years. Elijah, the prophet, fasted in the desert for 40 days and nights. And so all of this is context for what Mark is telling us. Whereas in Matthew and Luke's gospel, we have longer accounts of the temptation of Jesus, Mark gives us just a few details. No sooner has the Spirit of God descended upon Jesus at his baptism than it drives him into the wilderness. And Mark puts that much more strongly than the other gospel writers. It's as if the Spirit practically shoves Jesus into the obscure unknown of the desert at the moment we might expect his ministry to begin. God has just spoken from heaven these amazing words, This is my Son, the Beloved. In him I am well pleased. And then Jesus goes into the desert by himself for 40 days. Jesus emerges from the wilderness having endured Satan's temptations, and Mark tells us that Jesus was with the wild beasts, a unique detail to Mark's gospel. And when we hear that, it might sound threatening. We can maybe picture kind of these wild animals who you can only see their shadows lurking about, presence very ominous. But in the language of the original text, it could actually suggest that Jesus and these wild beasts are existing peaceably in the wild. This evokes the memory of the shalom that existed in the garden in the very beginning but was lost to human sin. And so as Mark tells us, tells us this story, recalling to our minds Genesis and Exodus and so many significant events of the people of God, our ears are attuned to the fact that someone very different is on the scene. After his time in the desert, Jesus appears in Galilee and announces that the time has now been fulfilled. God's rule has come near, and he issues the call to repent and believe the good news. Jesus passed the test where God's people had failed time and time again. When I read Mark's gospel, and maybe you have this experience too, sometimes I think, you know, would it have killed him to elaborate a little bit? But I think that this passage is one of those places where the brevity actually helps pull together theologically what might otherwise remain disconnected. In this short passage, I think we can trace three distinct moments or even movements that I think encapsulate the spiritual life of the follower of Jesus as a whole, but, but also the Lenten journey in particular. First, there is the call, where we are given the gift of vocation. In baptism, as we've said, we, we claim the words that God spoke over Jesus at his baptism. We are God's beloved, and God is well pleased with us. And it's crucial that this affirmation become foundational to the spiritual life because it determines how we experience everything that follows, particularly the next movement. Because at some point, the spiritual journey will lead us into the wilderness. And it can happen in a variety of ways. And it may last a little while. It might last months or even years. Journeys into the wilderness, they, they might be consequences of our own sinful choices. Or they might simply be circumstances completely out of our control, like an unexpected diagnosis, or the loss of a job, or, or being victim to the destructive decisions of others. Or it could also be an intentional move on our part. Within the Christian tradition, particularly in the 4th century Egyptian desert, the wilderness was the destination for women and men seeking to flee the corruption in the centers of power, the corruption that they saw in their faith once the emperor had embraced Christianity. And so they fled into the desert to seek a more pure practice of the faith. Ever since then, Christians have 
been seeking wilderness places, both literally and figuratively, to retreat from the corruption and spiritual bankruptcy of society. And so whether we plan on arriving in the wilderness or whether we suddenly find ourselves surrounded by wilderness, our faith will be tested. And how different our experience will be if we've never heard and never believed the voice that calls us beloved. Because if the voice that we hear in those times is the voice of a God who, who is an impossible to please taskmaster for whom nothing is ever good enough, we won't stand a chance in the wild. If the voice that we hear is the voice of a God who's decent enough but, but not involved in our daily lives and really unmoved by the events of our daily life, then we won't stand a chance. But if our God is the God that we see in Jesus Christ, and if the voice that we hear is of the God in Jesus Christ, we recognize that he has himself gone through the wilderness ahead of us. And he accompanies us through our own wilderness, and by his very presence reminds us of that voice. If that's the voice that we hear, then we will make it through. We begin the season of Lent with placing a a cross of ash upon our foreheads on Ash Wednesday. But the cross of ash that we put on our foreheads is but a trace of that first cross made in water at our baptisms. Yes, we are dust, but God breathed life into that dust. In life and death and in everything in between, we belong to God. Lastly, when when God brings us through the wilderness, whenever that might be, we emerge as different people and are sent anew to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Just as Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness and then shows up in Galilee with this renewed sense of vocation and sense of purpose for his ministry, announcing the arrival of this kingdom so too when we emerge from our wilderness. But it's a different sort of good news than it was before we entered the wild. Having journeyed the inward and downward road into the darkness, we find that we were not as in control as we thought. We find that we didn't have it all figured out like we thought. We're humbled and we recognize our utter dependence upon God. And it might take years to fully realize how it was happening, but so often we find that our faith grew the most in the wilderness. The singer-songwriting duo known as Over the Rhine have a phrase that punctuates various songs on their latest album. And it's the phrase that the title of the sermon, also on the bulletin cover, it's the phrase, Leave the Edges Wild. And this was a phrase of advice given to them after they purchased a Civil War-era farm, but it grew to become a much larger metaphor for their life and their art. I've been thinking about that phrase this Lent because I find it so refreshing that the Church tells the truth about ourselves and the world in this season. We can leave the edges wild in that we can acknowledge the brokenness of the world and the brokenness right in our own lives. We don't have to pretend that our stories are perfect. We don't have to puff out our chests in self-congratulation and think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. As Over the Rhine writes in one song, leave behind your Sunday best. You know, We couldn't care less. Out here, we've learned to leave the edges wild. The wild edges of our story make us who we are, and they remind us that we belong to God and are desperate for God's grace in our lives. If you are in a season of wilderness, or if you are retreating into the wilderness in some way this Lent, Remember the voice that first spoke to you, the voice that called you beloved. And know that Jesus has gone before you and goes with you even now 
and throughout the whole journey in the church and in this place, you have permission to leave the edges wild. Hallmark really missed an opportunity this year. But they'll have a chance to redeem themselves once our Lenten journey concludes on the glorious light of Easter morning, which also happens to be April Fool's Day this year. Amen.